Welcome, Pewter Report readers and listeners and viewers to the latest edition of the Pewter Report podcast. Uh, you probably have been waiting for this one. I know that that uh, a lot of Buccaneer fans out there are excited to see our special guest. I'm Scott Reynolds. Alongside of me is John Ledyard. But the guy that we're really here to see is, is the Super Bowl champion general manager of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Jason Light, in the house tonight. Jason, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. I made a promise to you. Uh, seems like a month ago that we win the Super Bowl, I'd come on. So um, that's true. <laughs> this is my reward. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Jason. We appreciate it. Congrats on a great season, building a great roster, winning the Lombardi Trophy. I would like to claim a little bit of credit, if I may, for reverse jinxing this team to their first big win of the season with my tweet at the 10-0 point of the Packers game in Week Six, which I'll pull up for everybody here. You probably remember this tweet a little bit uh, because you replied to it after the game, quote tweeting it with the eyeballs emoji. Uh, so my first question to you is, am I the first media member that you have ever put on blast on social media? And uh, if so, how often has your finger hovered over the send tweet, but you restrained yourself at the last moment? <laughs> And Jason, there we go. All right. Okay. There you go. You, can you hear uh, us right? I can hear you. You, uh, I believe you might be the first. Yeah. You, uh, <laughs> it's an honor. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> it, it, it was fun. And obviously met you, knew you. Um, you know, it's not something I'm going to make a, a habit of doing. Those things can come back and bite you. And then, uh, <laughs> Thank, thank God it didn't come back and bite me this year. <laughs> well, I wouldn't have let you hear about it, but I did get a pretty big kick out of it at the time. I thought it was pretty funny, but yeah, we, I appreciate we, we, you not making it worse than it was. <laughs> you, you know, everybody wants, everybody in football wants to know about stats and cap numbers, Jason, but the, the numbers and the stats that I want to know about are how many Bud Lights you drank at the boat parade and, and did you set a personal record? Oh man, it's it was uh, it was one of the best days of my life. So, um, and it was high. It was a little. It was it was a nice day, but it was getting a little warm. I needed to stay hydrated. So, um, <laughs> it they probably did. I probably did set a set a record. I, I sweat most of it out today, um, <laughs> and uh, going to take it easy here, here for a few days. Had had it, had enough for it to last me for a couple months there last yesterday. <laughs> I bet. I have to ask. I have to ask Jason. What was your reaction when you saw footage, or maybe you saw some of it live? I don't know of Tom Brady throwing the Lombardi Trophy from one boat, Cam Brady catching it on another. Were your heart in your throat a little bit when you saw that? Well, Tom Brady's pretty accurate, and Cam Brady has great hands. So <laughs> I mean, I'm just wondering who would have dove in after it if it if it did if it did go in the water. I heard that's pretty deep. Yeah. So. Uh, no, he's the best uh, Lombardi catch I've ever seen, and maybe in the history of Lombardi catches. So maybe, that's right. Yeah. How much fun was that? I mean, just you talked about you know, being one of the best days of your life. I mean, being down there, being able to celebrate that with this city, to hold the Lombardi trophy in your hands. I mean, fans kind of imagine and they feel like they're connected to obviously the team, but they don't experience the battle and the journey of getting there firsthand like you all do. Can you walk us through it all, how that, that whole process felt? Well, I, I had no idea just how big this was going to be yesterday. They they really scrambled to put it together um, as quickly as they did for Wednesday. I know our people, our owners, a lot of people at uh, One Buck, along with the city and the mayor, uh, to get this going. So I didn't know at short notice they would have that many fans. And when we first took off out of Armature Works and I started just seeing the, you know, just the street lined with people and the, the canal, the river lined with people. And then to be with my family on the boat, um, have them with me. Uh, it was, I mean, it brought, you know, shivers down my spine. It was, mm -hmm. it truly was the fact that, you know, I'm with there with Bruce, but then just my family as well. It's just, just awesome to see all these fans so happy. It's, it's about them, you know, it's about the fans and that's what drives us. And that's what drives our owners and just so happy and proud for all of them, because I know that a Super Bowl win like this can, you know, it starts a whole new generation of Bucks fans. And, 
you know, kids growing up right now, like my kids age, they're going to be, they're definitely going to be Bucks fans for a, you know, a long time. Hopefully it doesn't take another 18 years, but uh, yeah. they're good. Bucks fans. Now I know there's a, there's a lot of Bucks fans and great ones, but I just mean, it's, it's just a whole new generation of them. Yeah. Jason, you and I spoke before the game on Sunday and I told you guys you were going to win this. How confident were you the morning of Super Bowl Sunday? I felt really, really good. And we all did. And I'm talking about my guys like Spytek and McCartney and Beal and um, Greenberg and even Bruce. But at the same time, you don't want to get cocky about it. And it was, I was like, I bet you Kansas City's feeling the same way. So yeah. I know that this isn't any kind of special feeling when we're having all of a sudden we were clairvoyant. Right. I felt really good about it. I felt good about the preparation. I felt good about the mood of the team the, the for the two weeks leading up to the Super Bowl. It was yeah. it really just amped up focus, just togetherness, teamwork, selflessness, and the tempo was outstanding. Now, you watched the game from the sidelines. I saw you and Mike Greenberg and, and down there from the sidelines instead of watching it like in, in a luxury suite or a box. W walk me through that. And then when did you feel like from the sidelines that the game was over and that you guys were going to be Super Bowl champions? Well, this started this year because of the pandemic. Back Going back to the Raiders game, they – wouldn't open up um, any of their suites for um, visiting club personnel, which most teams do. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, uh, they had decided they weren't going to do that. So we had some booths, but not suites. And I wanted the owners to to have those, yeah. um, obviously. So, and so I I told them I'm going to go down on the sideline, and it, I just I love the experience of you know, seeing it firsthand and seeing how the whole operation works and how these players that interact with each other. And it just gave me a, just a great sense of what our team, like the heartbeat of the team, mm -hmm. I'm not calling plays and I'm not uh, really coaching anybody up whatsoever, you know, just you know, giving fist pumps and, and attaboys, but yeah. it was just awesome. It's just great experience. And then in terms of the Super Bowl. I didn't. Uh, I didn't want to say. I didn't want to jinx anything. I. It was for me. It wasn't over until we were down in the ball. So um, they played great. I know we dominated that game. Mm -hmm. A lot of people said they knew in the second quarter or the third quarter or whatever, whatever time or whatever moment happened. But for me, it wasn't until we were down in that ball. Yeah. So what was the the Super Bowl after party like at the Florida Aquarium? It was really cool too. That was. Probably at the time, one of the best moments that I've had. And then I think the parade trumped it. It just be, yeah. not because the party wasn't awesome. Yeah. But once again, be there with my friends and my wife um, and see all the employees just. Jason was having some technical issues on his end uh, with with the, the stream yard. Um, call here. So it looks like he's frozen up there, but you know, it's, it's interesting, John. Uh, that's one of the things that, that I didn't really see until I watched some of the behind the scenes footage was seeing Jason light, Mike Greenberg, some of the guys from the front office being down there on the field right. and, and, and not watching it from, from, uh, you know, from, from a luxury suite or from a booth. So I, I think that that was, that's pretty cool perspective for the general manager because that, that's not something that you usually see as, as general managers. You might see them down there on the field at the end of a game, mm -hmm. um, the last couple of minutes, but you really don't see the, the general manager on there for the entire game. But that's something that really, uh, going back to, I think, Green Bay and, and even throughout the playoff run, Jason was down there on the field getting that perspective, you know. Right. And you're right. It's rare. But uh, as a team builder, it would also be kind of cool in some ways, I think, because you've built the team. But then how much do you get to see them, you know, firsthand? I'm sure you know, when you watch practice at times, but you've got a million other things to do. So you hear it from coaches and, and all kinds of stuff like that. But seeing it actually yourself on the sideline live, you know, that's a a, really a whole different thing and you can see the personalities of the players that you drafted start to come out and how they work together and whether you got what you expected or not with certain people or players um and you can see that obviously on the field too but i think being on the sideline you do have some of that ability to, to
to, to see that in a way that you probably didn't before. And so it is pretty interesting. Jason is on his end, uh, te- technically was having some of the difficulties on his end. I don't think it's a stream right. stream yard uh, issue. And so right. hopefully we get- the interesting thing is, is, is right before he came on, um, he was talking about having some technical issues and he didn't have that until it's really since the draft, you know? Yeah. So, there we go. Yeah. All right. I promise I'll stay on this time. <laughs> different device. Excellent. Well, we, we appreciate you rejoining us, Jason. So uh, I guess my next question to you is, is, um, you know, is really just, are there any behind the scenes stories from, from either the Super Bowl or from, from the 2020 season, you know, that, that, that fans, even the media, because we were really at arm's length, really having to conduct our business through Zoom calls for really the entire season. But, um, you know, you had an interesting story about Tom Brady, uh, you know, maybe choosing number seven if, if Chris Godwin didn't switch the numbers. But were there any type of, of interesting kind of anecdotes or behind the scenes things that, that might interest the fans out there? Well, there, I mean, this was just such a, a challenging year. There's a lot of them. Uh, I wouldn't know where to begin, but just a challenging year because of COVID and everybody, I mean, my, I am so proud of our Greg Skaggs and our Bobby Slater and um, Anthony Paroli and their staffs for just really policing the, 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 uh, through the protocols that we had to go through, just didn't want to bring down an entire position group or have a lot of players out for a week. And we really had low numbers this year, and it was a testament to them. It's also a testament to our head coach who, mm-hmm. um, very first meeting, says he finds out anybody gets COVID and gives it to him, he's going to he's, he's, he's gonna whoop their ass. So, <laughs> um, so um, anyway, um, you know, every day just waiting for the test to come in seemed like uh, an eternity, and it was always about the same time at night. So, if, and Bobby Slater or Greg Skaggs would be the ones to tell me. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, if I, if I ever got a text from them, the, immediately my heart just like <laughs> jumps out of my chest, even though it might be something, you know, completely right. different. Yeah. But just all of the, the protocols that we have changed almost every day. Um, it was just a really challenging year. I think, I think there should actually be an asterisk next to this Super Bowl season, an asterisk meaning, not only did we win the Super Bowl, we also we also beat COVID. You know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's fascinating. I mean, obviously, like we hear stuff and we know the protocols are changing, but I've spent some time just thinking in my head, like, man, just every day you're waiting to see like if anybody tested positive on your team, and you know it has a drastic impact on the outcome of a season. So yeah, it, it is fascinating stuff. I do want to move Jason and talk a little bit if we can about your evaluation process and building this team because. On the outside, I think people will see Tom Brady come to a team that wasn't in the playoffs last year and then win the Super Bowl, and they will just kind of easily attribute that to him. And obviously, we know Brady deserves all the credit in the world, you know, plays the most important position on the field for sure. But this team was already really talented and ready to take another step when he got here. And it's a major reason why he ended up coming here. I want to talk specifically about the secondary if we can. It seems like early on when you were a GM, you drafted Vernon Hargraves, and that didn't really work out. And I'm just curious, what changed in your evaluation process, especially at the cornerback position, to draft guys like Carlton Davis, Jamel Dean, Sean Murphy, Bunting? What changed in that evaluation process that resulted in those guys as opposed to some of the players you might have drafted earlier as your tenure as GM? Well, you take a look at, you know, the successful corners around the league, and you sometimes you get, we all get a little wild with just purely athleticism. And you know, our stats or, you know, hands, ball skills, those things are all important. But at that position in this league now, you need length uh, and you need toughness and you need your corners to set the tone. Um, And they need to, you know, be able to, you know, not only just win at the line of scrimmage, but also tackle and, and just, like I said, set the tone. And we were fortunate enough to be able to draft guys like Carlton It started with him, but then Sean Murphy Bunning and Jamel Dean. And, um, you know, they, they've just really developed well, but that's, that's, that's also a testament to the coaches yeah. um, for the way they develop and Todd Bowles and Kevin Ross and all of them. Um, but it's, you know, you need that length, you need that toughness, you need to be athletic and it's hard to find everything, but these guys have an element of all those things. 
Yeah, it re really, you flooded the position too. It wasn't just like drafting one corner. You drafted, you know, three and actually four, including MJ Stewart. But um, but you really flooded that over a two year span, essentially. Yeah, you're not going to hit on all your picks. You just aren't. You're going to try, but it just doesn't work out that way. You know, the 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 best of the best that are in the Hall of Fame have have missed on a lot of picks, and they say mm -hmm. if you hit on fifty percent of them, you're of your top, you know, round picks, you're, uh, you're doing, you're doing well, but we want to do better than that, obviously. But so to flood it, yeah, we, we knew that, you know, there's a chance some of these are the guys aren't going to work out, but let's make sure that we have some that do. So mm -hmm. make it sound easier said than done, but it just, it's just the way the draft works. Right. No, you're no question about it. That, that definitely is the case, especially in that position. It's, you know, big transition to the NFL with the wide receiver talent and the passing offenses they face there. Uh, Tristan Wirfs, Jason, this guy came into the NFL and I mean, Scott and I would talk about it every week. We would watch the tape and I would just be like, I mean, I remember saying to Scott after week one and I, I was high on Tristan Wirfs coming into the draft. I knew he was good. I didn't know how quickly he'd be as good as I knew his talent could be. I watched him week one against Cam Jordan, and I said something along the lines to you, Scott, that, like, I think this guy, like, might be the best tackle in the league someday after after week yeah. one. I mean, that's how he ridiculous it is. Jordan, he made Cam Jordan look ordinary in week one, and that's no small feat. Yeah, so how stunned were you that he was at 13? Were you? Did you know that other teams might not be as high on him as you guys? Uh, no, I, I can't say that. Um, I was stunned. I saw him starting to fall. I was trying to go – get him as high as like, uh, well, even a, even higher than nine and nobody wanted to make any deals. And I think we made the first draft trade of the pandemic mm -hmm. at home draft. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we, there was, a, there was, there are teams, but I, there was one in particular that I was very worried about going up to San Fran and, and they, that were, that was below us. And it turned out that that's, it was going to happen or they were seriously considering this trade, but they didn't want to go back as that far. They're afraid of losing their guy that they took in law. So um, I, you know, the fourth round pick, that was easy for me to go do it. Um, if it had been any less than that, they wouldn't have taken the trade. That's interesting. Uh, which, which team was that? Are you not allowed to say? <laughs> not a liberty to say. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, you know, so, uh, yeah, trench play has been, has been a, a big, uh, you know, a big deal for you. I remember, you know, a couple of years ago when you really flooded the defensive line, right? You went out and you you signed guys like like Vinnie Curry, you drafted Vita Vea, you picked up Carl Nassib, you know, and you just flooded that position because the previous year you didn't like getting pushed around in the trenches, you know, and, and that's, you're a trench guy, right? You played offensive line in college and, and you win in the trenches. And I think one of your best moves Aside from from signing Ryan Jensen, but I think one of your best moves, and you took some some flack for it because Gerald has some of his fans. But swapping out McCoy for for Sue, that was a bit of a controversial move, but it ultimately was the right move because of of the different mentality that he brought. But it's also the durability. You said something to me when that happened. Um, Sue is one of the most durable players that you've ever scouted or seen before i mean the only time that he's missed a game is like when he's stomped on somebody and got suspended but but this guy never gets hurt it, 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 just just tell me about about his his presence and his durability and what that's meant for your team yeah well i have a lot of respect for gerald he and i still have a very good relationship and he was one of the first to to reach out and congratulate uh me which i have a lot of respect that's for. very classy yeah and um you know, he's unfortunately had some injuries uh, this this last year that he missed the year. But but in, in terms of Sue, um, he's just a very tough guy. He's an Iron Man. I, like you said, he's hardly missed. I think he has a record for D lineman consecutive starts. And um, it, it's a different kind of game. He's a powerful guy. He's very a very strong technician, strong with his hands. Um, he makes a, it's a good duo in there when he and Vita in there together. Mm -hmm. Um, and he understands his opponent. He puts a lot of work into it. He's a true pro. Um, I've been really happy with Sue. We'd love to have Sue back. Um, he's just a true pro takes care of his body. What, yeah. what, do you, what, what, what do you, what are your thoughts initially? Cause he's 34, you know, he's got twins on the way. I, I know that the, the season just ended, but I mean, do you have a, a pulse, a sense from even being down there on the sidelines that do you think he wants to come back for another year in the NFL? Oh, I think I think he's I think he's said it. Uh, he would love to come back here. Okay. Um, 
I know that we've where well, there's mutual uh, respect for each other, and mm-hmm. and uh, we we I told him that we'd like to have him back. So we're just kind of letting the dust settle here for a couple of days, and yeah. uh, you know we've got some time here. Um, you 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 never you never hit utopia, I guess, unless you win the Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> but you a lot of the things we want to try to do, I you, I'm hoping we can do, but um, we'll have to see how it all shakes out. But he's definitely one that we want back. Yeah. You and Bruce kind of said, or Bruce especially said at the at the parade uh, at the at the boat parade that the plan is to bring everybody back. He was very outspoken about that on the mic, uh, saying guys would be back and they weren't going anywhere. But we know free agency is a two way street, so like out of your twenty five unrestricted free agents, I guess maybe seven of them could be considered starters due to like their playing time. Levante, Sue, who you just talked about, some Shaq Barrett, Chris Godwin, Rob Gronkowski, Leonard Fournette, Antonio Brown. Do you think it's realistic to assume that everybody will be back or maybe five out of seven, six out of seven? How do you view that right now? You know what? Once again, I'm just going to – we're going to take a step back here and kind of uh, wait here for a few days. And then we've got we've got plans. We've got plans mm-hmm. in place. I would love it if they did. Um, yeah. We're um, – you know, there's only so much cap room that can go around. But, um, you know, there's – we're in really good shape because of Mike – uh, Greenberg and Jackie Davidson, but Mike's been here a long time. Um, there's some creative things we can do to, and we still have to find out what the cap is, but, um, the, 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 the Glazer family has proven this year that they will let us use resources to put a great team together. So we're going to do the best we can. Yeah. I'm curious about that cap because you talked about it and I was actually talking to a cap expert last night on the show and he was kind of telling me that the the Bucs actually have the most amount of cap space for 2022 out of any team in the NFL right now available. So there's kind of that wiggle room. Is that intentionally how you guys set up contracts so that you know, uh, kind of maybe unlike a team like New Orleans that kind of has kicked that can down the road, you guys have opened up a lot of space in the future to be able to have some wiggle room, right? Well, yeah, and it, it predates me here as the GM, the way that they like to do contracts. And um, like I said, Mike's done a great job. We've, it's, it's, we haven't had to kick the can down the road, and we've uh, been able to uh, be in a really, really good shape right now. Um, so, you know, uh, there's different ways that teams, different philosophies. Sometimes this, this happens to work for us right now because it puts us in great shape. But, um, yeah, we, we've got the ability to, to field a very good team. I can promise you that. You know, Donovan Smith is is a guy who's, uh, you know, he, he's had his critics, you know, in in the media, and and I've criticized him at times, but but also in the fan base. But but I mean, this year, this was essentially a contract year for him. He is under contract next year, but the guaranteed money is, is gone after this year. But I mean, I, I think he's played his best football consecutively. Um, maybe the Detroit game was was he had some rough spots, but. But really, since the bye week and all the way through the postseason, he has been absolute dynamite. Could you just speak to to Donovan and and how important that means, and especially with Brady coming back? I, I don't I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I don't think you want to go out and draft the left tackle and necessarily replace Donovan Smith, especially with how well he's playing. Well, I'll just say that I'm really proud of Donovan. Uh, I said it during the game, actually, or it was that right after the game on Sunday. Um, just you know, I was proud of how he steps really stepped up during the playoff run and at the end of the year. Um, you know, he's got a lot of critics. I have a lot of critics, kind of like kind of live parallel lives a little bit and uh, <laughs> came out on, as, you know, winning the Super Bowl. So, yeah. um, you know, he's he's got a great attitude and he's very, very well liked in the organization and in that in that old line room. He's a leader. So it's a lot of things that the fans don't see is what he what he brings to the team in terms of that and just not missing – very, very few times has he missed a game, and uh, yeah. Josh Wells in the last two years has stepped in for him very admirably mm-hmm. in both of them. But um, just the convenient uh, him be, being available um, and and the toughness and pride that he has of making himself available each week is is a is a is a huge trait that he has, a positive yeah. trait. You know, th- there was an issue last year where you used the the linebacker franchise tag on Shaq Barrett. He objected to that, filed a grievance, kind of like what Matt Judon did in Baltimore, saying that he was really a defensive end because of how often he's used in a four-man pass rush. Are you resigned to the fact that you might have to pay Shaq defensive end money as opposed to linebacker money? He's, he even said today on uh, on a radio show that he wants to break the bank. He wants to stay in Tampa, Jason, but he wants to break the bank. You know, that's all I'm 
probably won't touch on that. You know, I'm proud of Shaq and, and I understand this is business and, you know, there's no hard feelings over this and, you know, it's just part of doing business, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens, but we'd love to have Shaq back. That's for sure. You've heard the expression kind of like letting the draft come to you. You've got the 32nd overall pick in the first round. So you really don't have any, any choice in the matter of letting the draft come to you, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I really like second rounders. I know that I've been criticized in the past for some of our second rounders, but we've also hit on some good ones. Um, so that 32nd pick really being at the top of a second round, there's a lot of things we can do with it. We could move up, but we could also move back, pick up some more picks. Um, there's usually a, a really good player available still. I mean, th throughout the draft, you know, we've, we've seen great players taken in all rounds. So mm -hmm. I, it's nice to see that we're at 32, to be honest with you. It means that you've made a lot of progress. And uh, <laughs> it also means that we have about 8 million scenarios we need to work through before a draft day of how far we can go up or how far we want to move back. Yeah, it's not as easy as mocking Jameis Winston to the Bucks, uh, Jason, or even Devin White, right, when you're picking in the top five. But, boy, you've been trying to get out of the top five, the top ten, out of the top 20 for a long time. It's interesting, though, right, because I, I would say, you know, from a trade perspective, the three most favorable trade spots, right, are kind of like that that number 32 pick. We saw Baltimore try to get up to, to get uh, Lamar Jackson, right, and then – um, and then also the, the 33rd pick, right? The second, uh, or I should say the first pick of the second round. That, that, that's where you see a lot of trades, a lot of movement as teams reset their boards after day one. Also, the, the first pick of the fourth round, resetting their boards after day three. So trading out of 32 could be favorable. As you said, you like the second round. If the price is right, and it's too good to pass up. But how much value is there into having a first round pick, even at 32, given the fact that there's a fifth year option? Oh yeah, no, it is. That's that's good. If 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 you know you hit on the player, yeah, that's awesome. It's great to have that. It gives you a little bit more flexibility um, when you're dealing with an extension. But um, you know, it's at, when you're picking down there, and I've been part of you know teams that have been picking in the in the late twenties and thirties. Um, usually, you can't go wrong if you pick the best available player, and it's hard to uh, at that point. It's hard to. To, like you, every team's going to have its needs, um, even winning the Super Bowl. Um, but it's hard to say this if if your need is whatever position it is, pick it. It's hard to say you're going to be able to get one of those a great player at that position because you you don't want to just be picking a player just because it's a position of need. Right. You got to yeah. like the player. Mm -hmm. I'd ask you what your draft needs are, but until you get free agency, you're not going to know that. So we'll pass that. And instead, I'll just kind of ask you, what do you feel like right now in evaluating this class and who's in it uh, and all the underclassmen that have come out? Where do you feel like this draft is strong and where do you feel like it's weak? Well, you know what? I still have a lot of catching up to do. And uh, I'm start next week, and I've watched – Quite a few players, but uh, all that Spike Deck and Mike Beal and the scouts—they've been—they've um, been grinding it pretty hard, um, very hard. We've already had one round of meetings. We're going to have another one soon, and you know, it. it before I comment on that, I kind of want to make sure I, I agree with what they're saying. Not that I don't trust them, but right. I want to get a better feel for it myself. It looks it looks to me like there's a lot of good skill positions um, on offense, right. and it looks like um, it looks like it's a pretty good. Uh, uh, defensive draft in terms of uh, you know depth of D line, but it's but it looks more so that it's tilted to offensive skill. Yeah, no, the no question. I understand that uh, process of not kind of hearing and knowing who's good, but then you want to actually focus and watch them yourselves and form your own opinions for sure. I have to ask you about just the process of scouting quarterbacks, right? You have a quarterback right now, Tom Brady, who is <laughs> as elite as he is. Reality is still forty three years old, and you can't. You know, you don't know what's going to happen with a quarterback that is. You know, next year he said he's coming back. Beyond that, I mean, there's I'm sure you've had some conversation, but there's no certainty. So what point does Tampa Bay start to think about the quarterback position in earnest? I know I've talked to other teams before, and it's like, oh, we see a quarterback two or three years from now being like a, a priority for us in the first round of the draft. But we start our evaluation process because the position is so important. We start that ahead of time. Is that kind of how you guys think about it? How are you kind of approaching the quarterback position in the draft this year? Well, we're we're obviously evaluating every quarterback like we do every year. Um, yeah, Tom's up there in age, but there's no telling how long he's going to play. I mean, he's certainly doesn't look like he's losing anything to me. So right. um, to for us to be out there – 
and being in a rush to draft a quarterback just to draft a quarterback saying, okay, this is after Tom retires, this is our next guy. Um, we'll be on the look for one. If there's one we absolutely love and he's there and it's makes sense, maybe we'll take one. We also like Blaine Gabbard a lot too. So I think it's a little early right now to say um, that we're looking for the next guy right now, yeah. um, especially coming off a, a year like Tom had and, and as uh, you know, as good as he looked. You know, Jason, um, I've covered this team for 25 years, and uh, I have I, I've been through five years of Josh Freeman. I've been through five years of Jameis Winston, and both of those guys were first round picks. If you go back and look since since really the Super Bowl in 2002, Brad Johnson was a free agent addition. Brian Greasy uh, and Chris Sims, but but Brian Greasy. In 2005, got the Bucks their other uh, NFC uh, South title. 2007, it was Jeff Garcia. In uh, in 2020, it, it was uh, Tom Brady. The common denominator is the veteran free agent in all of those situations. And there's different ways you can go, right? I mean, obviously, Kansas City's got Patrick Mahomes, a homegrown guy. Everybody wants to hit on that first-round quarterback. But you look at Bruce Arians, what he did out in Arizona with Carson Palmer. Um we did it out in Arizona in my 2000. They did it before that with Kurt Warner. So yeah, yeah, exactly. I see what you're saying. yeah. So it, it has has going through the and I'm not saying Jameis, uh, you know, personally, but just drafting a quarterback in the first round, waiting for that that player to develop into the the kind of player that leads you to the playoffs and ultimately to a Super Bowl. Um, it has 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 your your thought process on the on the next quarterback, whoever that is, after Tom Brady, changed through all of this process? You mentioned Blaine Gabbard. I, I don't know if it's changed, but it's just kind of maybe opened my eyes a little bit to make sure that you're not um, focused and singularly focused on fixing anything in the draft. So, um, like you said, there's different ways to skin a cat. It, this yeah. is this is this has worked out well. We've worked out well with some trades with JPP. Um, even Stevie McClendon this year, even though yeah. it was uh, as as big of a trade in terms of the amount that we gave up, um, Gronk was a fourth round pick, and then we've signed some some really good free agents over the last couple of years. So you want to build your core through the draft, which I think our guys have done a phenomenal job with, with like yeah. Devin White and Carlton, and I mean Liska Tristan and Antoine. Um, but you know, it, it just maybe you just want to make makes you realize you you don't have to be focused on one way of fixing it or yeah. getting the next guy. Yeah. You mentioned Blaine Gabbard. We didn't see much of him obviously due to Tom Brady's, um, you know, uh, health status being healthy all year long and, and upright, which obviously was, was great for you, for you guys. Um, but, but we didn't even see Blaine in the preseason. Now he was injured last preseason, but behind the scenes, what, what do you like about about Blaine Gabbard? And if if he had to go in for for a game, you know, for Tom Brady, um, you know, I think Bruce Arians said he would feel comfortable uh, with him. What what do you like about what you've seen behind the scenes? Because we haven't really seen much of him. Well, first of all, I love his energy. Um, he's I really have gotten close to Blaine this year, just being on the sidelines, like I've talked about before. Um, he's a, he's a really smart guy, but he is one guy. We, my scouts and I talk about this a lot. He's one guy. I just love watching him throw every day in practice because he has got a cannon yeah. and he's very accurate with his throws as well. And he can just really whistle them in there in tight, in tight windows. Yeah. So if, if he would have had been forced to play, like, you know, he played in the Detroit game, but if he would have been forced to play more, yeah. I think we would have been, we, he would have. Really opened the eye, a lot of people's eyes at how how talented he is, especially being in the same system for a couple of years. Right. So you, you wouldn't rule out him replacing Tom Brady. You couldn't cross him off the board. He could be the guy. Not going to rule anything out right now. Yeah. Well, the last question I have for you. Appreciate your time. Is is uh, you know, the only college all star game this year was the Senior Bowl, and you weren't there because you you were knee deep in in uh, in Super Bowl preparation. Thankfully. Um, but you know there won't be an NFL scouting combine. Uh, some of these draft prospects didn't even play in 2020 due to COVID cancellations of their season or or them opting out. Um, everything's going to be kind of based around the pro day. So how much of a challenge is this college scouting process for you guys this year? Well, it's going to be challenging, but it was for us last year too. 
And at least this year, there's a little bit more ability for us to get out and get to some of the pro days. Mm -hmm. I would say that last year, though, um, since we weren't able to get out yeah. just a little bit early on, just for a couple weeks, or maybe it was only a week, um, we focused on the tape and we made our decisions based on the tape. Yeah. And sometimes you can, you can make things too complicated um, by evaluating a lot of other things. Now, of course, we want to see them work out and all those things. But um, I think Bruce and I have talked about this several times. Um, our guys did a phenomenal job just grading the tape and bringing them to us so we could look at them too and, you know, filter them up, the, the top players. And you know, we look at a lot of players together. But um, the tape is what matters. Yeah. Well, you certainly did a fantastic job with with a couple of pieces in, in this year's draft for sure. Your first two two picks played major roles uh, in the Super Bowl win, Super Bowl Fifty Five, uh, winning general manager Jason Light. Uh, you, you know, Antoine Winfield Jr. is his he's junior, right? Because of his father is a legendary NFL player, but really, maybe he has to drop the junior and go with, with the deuces, right? Uh, after the Super Bowl, right? <laughs> Did he earn himself a new nickname? Uh you'll have to ask the players in the locker room that. But <laughs> he, he's already had a, he's already had a lot of respect from everybody. He's you know my guys, uh, my scouts, and our coaches did a fantastic job with him, yeah. and not just finding him but developing him. Yeah, Jason, I thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on a, on a long and fantastic season, a super season here in Tampa Bay for your Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, appreciate your time and. Uh, Go get some rest. I, I know you need it after this long season and that boat parade yesterday. <laughs> That's a good problem to have. Exactly. Look forward to throwing some more shade at you next year, John. Hey, I appreciate it, Jason. <laughs> Thanks for giving us some time tonight. I appreciate it, man. All right, guys. Yeah. Take care. <laughs> Take care. We'll see you. Jason Light, there he goes, ladies and gentlemen. He threw up the deuces, Scott. Yeah, I love it. He, he threw it up. It's like he watches the pod or something, know. you know? I know. He threw it up. That was great stuff. By the way, if you missed the beginning of the podcast with Jason, uh, the beginning, he talks a lot about the Super Bowl. I saw some people jumping in and saying, what about the Super Bowl and stuff? At the beginning, we talked about the Super Bowl a lot. Then we went through kind of how he built the team. Then we moved into free agents and draft evaluation process. So that's kind of the rhythm of the show. If you just jumped in here a little bit later, I've seen our audience kind of pick up as we go here. So uh, great stuff by Jason Light. Scott, we do want to make sure we get to our title sponsor here for sure. We will unpack a little bit of what Jason says and wrap up this podcast here over the next couple moments. But first, everything on this show has been brought to you, as always, by our friends over at Celtics. John, Celsius heat, orange sickle, got mine. baby. You got the got a little blueberry pomegranate. You know, yeah. Celebrate Jason Light podcast day. Exactly. So you know, a lot, a lot of fans ha have tried Celsius. It's, it's always cool, John, when we read our Twitter feed and we see people posting cans of Celsius, you know, pics of them drinking Celsius, or even just mentioning the Celsius official in there um, on the, the Twitter feed. And, and it's awesome. And, and so if you have not tried Celsius yet, what are you waiting for? Now's the perfect time. Celsius is going big. They're sponsoring the Pew Report podcast and they're, they're just about everywhere now. It's funny. I, I didn't really see them so much around town a year ago, but they're just blowing up now. So, uh, do yourself a favor. Click Pat McAfee was drinking a Celsius today. I, know, I couldn't right? believe yeah. it. I was like, exactly. This thing's taking over. I was it pumped. Is. Yeah. It, we went to a fantastic, uh, Super Bowl party at uh, Top Golf uh, presented yes. by Celsius Saturday night before the, the Super Bowl, which was really cool. Get a chance to meet those guys. It's great people, great product. If you want to find out where you can awesome. uh, order it from, all you got to do is click on those banner ads on PeterReport.com. They'll take it to Amazon.com and you can purchase them in in packs, have them sent right to your house. You can save money by, by buying them in bulk on Amazon. That's the appeal. Yeah. So you can also visit Celsius.com, click on the store locator, and find out exactly where Celsius can be purchased near you.
Absolutely. Scott, I do want to mention to people because a lot of people now that we had Jason kind of talk about or not talk about the free agents kind of dance or, you know, kind yeah. of entertain a couple, you know, but not going to ready to get into detail about them, which we expected. Yeah. But if you want to know about the free agents, what's possible with the free agents, make sure you go back to yesterday's podcast. Brad Spielberger was on. He works for uh, over the cap. He does stuff there. That's a resource NFL teams use. You can trust Brad on these. Things. A lot right. of people do not know what they are talking about, about the cap online. I've learned that the hard way. There are only a few people who I go to. I go, I check everything I think with them to make sure because the cap is complex. So no matter what you think about it, go listen to yesterday's podcast. I'm not even saying that. So we have great numbers. I'm saying that so that you have understanding. Brad yeah. was incredibly clear. He laid out the scenarios for Tampa Bay, exactly how clear he was that the Bucks can bring back as many of these free agents as they want to bring back, it's just a matter of they have to we'll restructure things because they have a ton of money open in 2022 and 2023, more money than any other team in the league, actually. They're in the best cap position for next offseason as any team in the league. So they have a lot of flexibility. You heard Jason kind of touch on it there. We have a lot of options to move money around, and, and that's kind of what he's talking about. So if they want people back, they're going to get them back. Right. He doesn't want to say anything because he doesn't want to lose the leverage. Right? Yeah. If he's like, oh, yeah, we'll do anything, you know, he's obviously not going to say that. But sure. that's the process right now for the boxes. They want to find the price that's best for them, obviously, while still yep. rewarding the player. But they don't want to go uh, take advantage of the fact they have a lot of cap space in the future, Scott. But it's certainly something that they're processing and evaluating right now. Exactly. And, and I think the, the two things, too, uh, Jason talked about Mike Greenberg, the Bucks capologist. And, and th this is something that, that, that fans should know. Um, Mike Greenberg was hired by Mark Dominic, and Jason inherited – Mike Greenberg and and gave him a year to kind of prove himself and get get to know him and um, and decided to keep him make him the right hand man and those two have worked incredibly close together and 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 what Greenberg has been exceptional at is is not going the way of the signing bonus but instead giving out roster bonuses and guaranteed money because signing bonuses are prorated throughout the contract. So it, let's say if you if you have to or you want to cut a player three years into a five year deal, would the last two years of that proration come back to bite you as dead cap money? So if you give a guy, let's say, a five million dollar signing bonus over five years, that's a million dollars each year, and you cut him after year three, that two million dollars comes back as dead money. But the way that Greenberg does it with guaranteed money, and if you've seen some of these contracts, you'll see that the first two years are guaranteed typically out of a three or four or five year deal. And, and why yeah. the guarantee? Well, obviously you, the player is going to be on the team the first year. That's why you signed him or re-signed him, right? right? So that's one year. And then the second year, um, you know, a, a player is usually going to be productive. And even if they end up getting replaced, you know, in the starting lineup, they'll be gone by year three. And that's when mm -hmm. the dead cap money expires. That's right. when the guaranteed money is not there. And I think that the other thing that, that's important about Jason Light and Mike Greenberg is regardless of the player, they will put a not for public consumption line in the sand. They will have a, a number. And if the number uh, gets crossed, um, they, they will let the player go. Usually the player will mm -hmm. kind of come to their senses and try to try to meet them where the bucks are. Yes. But that's that's one thing that, that Jason and Mike do a very good job of is not uh, crossing that line, not overpaying for a player. I think the one time they kind of did that a little bit and it came back to bite him was early on in Jason's tenure with Doug Martin, with the Doug Martin contract. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. A couple of comments I want to get to real quick and then I'll make a point. Uh, Long Lost Glazer says over the cap and spot rack. Those are the websites. They are in some capacities, but over the cap, much more consistently good Agreed. information than spot rack. Spot rack will mess things up at times and you don't want to be relying on them over, over the cap. Just use over the cap. Over it's the cap. just a much better, yeah, just a much better website. And it's, I don't know how much that's known in the fan world, but in the, in the media side, it's pretty well known. Uh, Shaq's wife wants the highest bidder after that Jacksonville story. I'm not sure what the story is there. I hope we get a chance to ask Shaq about it, honestly, because I'm very curious. Yeah. The, the Instagram story that lasted for five seconds while Shaq has been as adamant as any free agent player we've ever seen about like yeah. what his intention is uh, to come back. Shaq has priced himself at $20 million a year. Uh, Brad mentioned yesterday on the show he thinks it will be more like 18 to 19 range. We'll see. Um, you know, I think he could be closer to 18 and and probably take it at this point. And again, yeah. the guaranteed money that Scott talked about is important 
too in that regard because you don't want to guarantee Shaq out five years. You want to guarantee him out three probably at 28 years old. So something to think about there. And Evan brings up Ryan Suckup. Uh, we didn't talk about him today on the show, but we talked about him yesterday on the show with Brad. So jump back and, and listen to that one. We did touch on Brian Suckup and re-signing him. To me, Scott, the most interesting thing that Jason said on that segment of the podcast was about Indomitian Sue about how Sue has, has told him he wants to come back, you know, and that they've, they've expressed that mutually, basically, obviously the respect for each other is known, but yeah. you know, and I'm sure, you know, Sue is still probably considering whether he wants to keep playing or not after this season at 34 years old, second right. oldest D tackle after, um, after uh, Steve McClendon to take a snap yeah. this season. But you know, that was interesting to hear Jason say with some confidence that Sue, it seemed like from what Jason said, that Sue wants yeah. to keep playing. Yeah, no, definitely. And I thought the other thing that was really interesting was was um uh the the love and the adoration about Blaine Gabbert and and that's interesting because that, that's something that I've I've heard behind the scenes uh and off the record conversations with multiple people at, at one buck in your place is how highly regarded Blaine Gabbert is and so I kind of wanted I, there was a little bit of, of a leading question because I wanted Jason in his own words to talk about Blaine Gabbert but I'm telling you right now I, I know that yeah. that Buck fans might be cringing out there, uh, envisioning the Jacksonville version of Blaine Gabbard and all that. But the interesting the, the thing that Bruce Arians has said about Blaine Gabbard is, is this year was the first time in Blaine Gabbard's career that he's been in the same system with the same offensive coordinator for back to back years, and and and, and, and listen, Blaine Gabbard. You know, there there was a skill set there that got him drafted in the first round, and you heard Jason. Talk about how how he much he loves watching him throw the ball, and the guy's got an absolute cannon for an arm. He's got the size. He's more mobile than, than Tom Brady. Um, you know, he he reminds you a little bit of, of of Jameis Winston in that way, where he can make things happen with his legs. Matter of fact, if you recall, yeah. in, in the last preseason, the Buck had in 2019, he got injured because he was scrambling and he hurt his shoulder and was out for the year. But well, he converted like a yeah. third and fifteen against the Lions, I think, Scott, didn't he? With a run, he converted something I, yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah, and, and it's funny because you mentioned the Lions game. Um, he only played the second half, but he was 9-16, 143 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, you, you really can't glean much from, from that little thing there. But this is a guy that spent three years in Jacksonville, three years in San Francisco, one year out in, out in Arizona. Um, in, uh, in Bruce Arians' final year out there, that's where he got to know uh, Blaine. And and then a year in Tennessee and then a year in Tampa. Um Actually, two years, but he was out yeah. all of last year with that shoulder injury. But the the thing that I want Buccaneer fans to to keep in mind is you look at at your own Super Bowl champion quarterback in Brad Johnson. He was an afterthought. He was a journeyman that that had to go from Minnesota and kind of establish himself in Washington. Then he finally made the Pro Bowl, and then he finally won a Super Bowl in Tampa. Rich Gannon, the guy he went up against in the Super Bowl, was a real journeyman, bouncing around the league. And, and what do those guys have in common? When Brad Johnson and Rich Gannon met in the Super Bowl back in 2002, both of them were in their 30s. Sometimes it takes quarterbacks a while to, to learn and, and gain the trust and, and develop. And, and, and a lot of people aren't patient with quarterbacks. That's why Blaine got, got bounced out of Jacksonville. Uh, and he wasn't around a good team. So I'm not saying he is the, the – the next quarterback, but I'm just saying yeah. you, you can't rule him out either. Right. I mean, uh, important distinction for me to make at least is that I don't think Jake Blaine Gabbert's the next quarterback of anybody's franchise. I really don't. And I think the Lions game, yes, there were some good things, but there was also a lot of bad things. I mean, he missed simple throw. I know Jason denotes his accuracy there, but I, I, I would disagree on that point. I think his arm is great. He can make every throw in terms of the degree of difficulty, but I do think accuracy-wise there's concerns there. We've seen enough – sample size of Blaine Gabbert where I would have very little faith in him being you know a, a Super Bowl contending quarterback like Brad Johnson different NFL obviously in today's day and age yeah. but to Jason's point I do think that the door is open for Blaine Gabbert to become an option after Tom Brady right you were looking at options right. at this point you were talking yeah. about potentially two three years from now you have no right. idea what anything's going to look like so yeah. what he's doing all he's doing is keeping options open if Blaine Gabbert's developed great since then you know, since yeah. this point in time, at that point, then he becomes an option to compete and start with someone else if there's no clear cut Tom Brady like yeah. option available in free agency. He's just keeping options open. Bucks fans don't yeah. need to get up in arms. They are not banking on yeah. Blaine Gabbard as the quarterback of the future. But you're right. Like, it is clearly from what Arians has said and what Light has said, 
they they actually like Blaine Gabbert. They will consider him at some point in time if there isn't another obvious answer. We have no idea whether there will be an obvious answer at that point in time. Yeah. So, you know, we're just kind of speculating a, a little bit on that. By the way, if you're listening to the Peter Report podcast for the first time, I see some people commenting on it. That's awesome. Uh, we do this four times a week. We go live. It's a lot of fun. We're going to be going live Monday through Thursday. It's going to be a blast. So make sure you search Peter Report. At 4 p.m., right? We're going back to – thank you for reminding me, Scott. We're going back to 4 p.m. next week, okay? 4 p.m. time slots uh, will be uh, and next week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 4 p.m. We've got great guests lined up for the offseason. We're already finding some of those people. There will be draft talk, free agent talk. We'll have players on. You know, we'll have uh, staff, all those kind of things, team staff. It'll be – it's going to be a great time. So if you're a Bucks fan or if you just like the NFL draft and player evaluation and free agency, we'll have plenty of days where we're just talking about those things too. So hit – Subscribe on Peter Report TV, hit the bell to get the notifications, and uh, it, it'll be some pretty cool stuff. I think you'll enjoy yep. uh, the podcast for sure. And Scott, yeah. it was a good time with Jason. Do you was. have any other thoughts before we wrap up here? Um, well, there was a super chat just a, a, a second ago here. Uh, is is Shaq worth breaking the bank for? Uh, I wouldn't mind paying Shaq $18 million a year on, on, a, on a, a small deal, like a three-year contract um three year guaranteed but, yeah yeah given the fact the yeah, three year three year contract with two years guaranteed i think that would be fair at an average of 18 point million um and then you draft a an edge rusher we haven't talked about my mock draft yet we'll get that in, into that for next week um but quincy roche is a guy we have in the second round from from miami via the way of temple um but i think you want to get a, another young edge rusher into the hopper to develop behind jason pierre paul and shaq barrett i don't think that that uh, Anthony Nelson is that that edge rusher of the future, and even though Cam Gill had half a sack in the Super Bowl, um, you know we haven't seen enough from him to really make any right. any conclusions. But yeah, I, I I think Shaq has done enough in these two years to prove his importance and worth, and especially since you have a Super Bowl ready team again in 2021, John, bring him back. But a short term deal, uh, no more than three years, given the fact he's already 28 years old. Well, you, yes, and it's a good point, Scott. The term of the deal is going to be whatever amount of years, but the guaranteed money is, uh, it's, as most fans even know this part, it's it's what you look at, right? So the guaranteed money for my guess is for Shaq Barrett will be will be fine, will be great, it'll be what he wants. When that money hits will be what he, is going to be the yeah. debate, right? So this year, what something Brad posed is it could be something like $7 million this year, and everybody's going to say, what, $7 million? Yeah. But next year, remember, the Bucks have the most – cap space of any team in the NFL going into 2022, 2022 offseason, yeah. right? So they can bump him up and then make almost all of that hit of the guaranteed money in 2022. And all right. basically they're betting on is that by 2022, Shaq Barrett won't fall off a cliff or suffer right. some kind of, so that's what they're banking on basically at that point. So it becomes a pretty safe deal. And then in the third year, you have some guaranteed money. It isn't as significant a money, but you kind of pack in to that 2022 year when you won't need as much cap space for that season because yep. you'll have, you already have a ton of space available basically at that point in time. You don't want to put too, bu- too much, right. but you 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 can pack a lot of it into that year and put very little of it in 2021, and it's, it's guaranteed for like him a, either way. It's almost like a good insurance deal, right, John? Yes. It's exactly what it's like, Scott. <laughs> yeah, Brilliant speaking, work by you. <laughs> speaking of insurance, uh, what a year for the insurance world, right? A record number of name storms at more than 30. We had flooding in addition to the wildfires and, of course, the pandemic, COVID-19. With commercial property and homeowner rates increasing across the industry due to these catastrophes, Briar Greaves Insurance Agency has numerous carriers and options to help new and existing clients affected by those increases. Uh, if you want more information, go to briargreavesinsurance.com for life insurance, commercial insurance, homeowners insurance, auto insurance, boat owners insurance, only one place to turn. It's where I do my insurance. It's at Briar Greaves Insurance. The folks at Briar Greaves are big fans of the Buccaneers, proud sponsors of the Pewter Report podcast. Check out their website, briargreavesinsurance.com. Give them a call at 813-876-4166. That's 813-876-4166. So, Scott, we've covered a lot of ground in this podcast, most of it with Jason, and it was some good stuff being able to hear from him and really just seeing his excitement about the Super Bowl. I mean, I like we say I always, say, we're not fans, but we're crazy if we say we don't want this team to win. And so being able to see that at the parade with the players and the coaches and yeah. Jason and being able to see it today on the podcast is a pretty cool thing. 
It really was. It, we started off the week, John, on Sunday night with uh, with the Super Bowl uh, podcast right from Raymond James Stadium at midnight. And here we are wrapping up the week with the Super Bowl winning general manager, Jason Light, on our Thursday podcast. So we hope to see you all next week, Monday through Thursday. It's our regular schedule at 4 o'clock Eastern time. Every single Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday throughout the off season, we're going to be on having special guests like Jason Light um, throughout the entire off season, keeping you informed about the Bucks' free agency and draft plans. And uh, we hope to see you there. If you have not subscribed to our Peter Report TV channel on YouTube, do so now. It's at Peter Report TV on YouTube. Click the subscribe button and notifications. That'll let you know when we're on. But we'll be on next. Monday at 4 o'clock here on Peter Report uh, with the podcast. So for John Ledyard and for our special guest, Jason Light, I'm Scott Reynolds saying we'll see you on our next edition of the Peter Report podcast. Out. Out.